Sally Bonan, Habari, hello everyone and welcome to this session. We are here, we've been mandated to discuss creative ways in which we can provide finance. One of the thoughts I got from E's presentation was that capital is not short. We do have capital. Question is, how do we get it to the people? And I think you're going to hear many clever turns of expression, many complicated descriptions of how we should be able to get this money to the people. But the basic question we want to answer today is how do we get the money to the people who need the money? Why do we need to innovate? I think all of us, because of uh, the period that we've just undergone, have heard a lot about innovation. We need to innovate, let me try and answer part of it. Because the US Federal Reserve underestimated inflation and now is playing catch up. And in the process of playing catch up, they are going to squeeze and hurt a lot of people, including business people, including entrepreneurs, the people who create capital. So we have to be creative in how we get that money to the people. The coronavirus has squeezed our budgets. I think all of us, or many of us at least, are now familiar with terms such as fiscal space. Government budgets are stretched, company budgets are stretched, and banks, yes, have to find ways to provide capital while at the same time themselves, they are keeping adequate capital to cover for all kinds of risks uh, that continue to be developed us. Inflation is amongst us. I don't think anyone needs to be educated about inflation. But I dare say, in Zimbabwe, where I come from, they understand inflation better than anyone else. They've been dealing with it for a long time. So now the rest of the world is playing catch up. But I can tell you, there might be lessons to be got from uh, uh, Zimbabwe. So how do we get that capital to the people? This is the question I'm answering, and I've got very, 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 very clever people who are going to help me to try to answer that question. They are bankers, and then there are other bankers that I have termed uh, bankers who are schooled in regulation, and you'll see what I'm talking about when we get into it. And then we also have a policymaker amongst us who also speaks on behalf of a government. You're also going to discover who that is. So this session is going to explore the opportunities and challenges with innovative financing models and how governments and businesses can make the most of them for the Commonwealth. One of the questions we need to be addressing here is how uh, we can help shape the Commonwealth agenda, generate insights and share knowledge. And we're hoping that by the end of the session, we will have shared with you our strategies that governments and businesses can apply as we rebuild post the pandemic. I'm going to start with you, Diane. Just your general thoughts in respect to the need for innovation, a term that you live with daily as a bank, given the people who are knocking at the door hungry for your lunch. So I, I'll start maybe with uh, an Amber. Uh, we recently worked on, on SME, MSME financing in Rwanda, and, and one figure really uh, came out. Uh, the funding gap for MSMEs in Rwanda was in, estimated in 2017 to be 1 trillion Rwanda francs, which is about $1 billion. Today, post-COVID, I think this is a segment that has been the most affected by the pandemic, we estimate that the funding gap is $3 billion, which is significant. You know, as, as Bank of Kigali, the largest bank in the country, our balance sheet is half of that. So, so that shows that there is a funding gap we need to play our part as a bank, but there is a need for innovation. Uh, because again, we are looking at a segment with over 200,000 of clients who need financing. So we need to get to them. We believe technology is going to be an equalizer in making sure that people access, uh, have access to the services. And in the past couple of years, when you look at access to finance, uh, it's been, you know, it's close to 100% in Rwanda. Everyone pretty much has access to finance. But we now believe that uh, access to finance is, uh, is a flow, not a ceiling. Because having access is one thing, but we now need to deepen this access to finance and have more credit access, uh, accessed by people, many more products that are relevant for the development, especially that now we are trying to recover from the pandemic. 
So yes, innovation is absolutely critical mm -hmm. if we want to uh, uh, meet that gap, $3 billion in Rwanda only. And uh, I think we need to play our part. Now, what we are doing uh, as, as an innovation, uh, you know, as a bank, because we are, you know, quite a regulated uh, sector, mm -hmm. so we can't just do anything. So what we're doing is that we want to find a way to support uh, MSMEs by providing banking, this is, you know, banking services is what we do, we, you know, but also non-financial services. Mm -hmm. So we just set up uh, an SME center, it's not very from, far from here, where we want to get people to understand uh, their business needs, to understand how they work and how we can support them. And I think this is really going to bridge the knowledge gap between the bank and, and the, the clients. So we can, you know, maybe try to deploy, you know, our plan is to deploy about uh, $500 uh, million dollars in the next two years in SME financing. But we believe, coming back to what uh, E was talking about, um, there are other you know, instruments to finance SMEs. Banking, banking loans is a thing, but we really need to have access to this abundant capital out there. Uh, we have billions, trillions of, of dollars in, in total savings. Uh, and I believe when you look at uh, uh, total savings globally, as a percentage of total income, I think it's probably is the highest it's ever been because of very many years of quantitative easing, etc. So we have abundant uh, capital in a part of the world and we have the investment opportunities here and on the continent in Africa with the most social uh, return on investment, economic uh, return on investment. So we need to find a way to bridge that gap. Yeah. So we will do our role as, as we play our role as, as banks, but we need to get more people coming in uh, to, to uh, meet that gap. Thank yeah. you. I'll begin with a soft question to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Soft question. Do you need assistance? I need what everyone's kind? assistance here. <laughs> I see some policy makers. Of course, we need their support. Uh, I probably have uh, regulators in the room. Uh, we need to see how we work together as an industry to make yeah. sure this funding, and you know, some of it, we have it, mm -hmm. gets uh, to the people. Uh, we have technologists. I see Shola is on the panel. We need to see how we can partner. We're already partnering with uh, uh, Chantal, uh, mobile money to see how people can get services beyond the payment and remittance service, how people can get access to credit. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need really to work together because yeah. uh, the, the gap is huge yeah. and uh, only us as banks cannot uh, uh, do what it takes. 100%. Thanks. Nick, let me come to you. So I want your opening thoughts. Uh, so uh, BI, British International Investment, is the UK's development finance institution. So our job is to get money to countries that, that need it most. So for us, that means in, in Africa and Asia. We invest about $2 billion a year. Uh, we have about 70% of that money goes to Commonwealth countries. About 60% of it goes to countries in Africa. We have um, historically and successfully, I think, uh, provided capital to large companies. And we do that typically by investing in large funds and by investing, investing directly. I think the challenge for us um, is around this SME question, which is what uh, uh, Diana referred to. Uh, and historically, whether, we use, whether we've used banks as intermediators or whether, we, whether we've used funds as intermediators, it's been very difficult uh, for money to reach SMEs. And I should say, by the way, this is not a problem that's exclusive to Rwanda or to Africa or to emerging markets. I mean, this is something that if I go to the UK and I go to the north of England and I listen to small, small and medium-sized enterprises, they will tell me the same thing. The challenge is, and I've worked in banking for 25 years, it is an enormous challenge for banks to reach these type of companies. And there are two reasons for that. First of all, the cost of reaching them. And the second uh, reason, because it is very difficult to assess the credit in many cases. So banks resort to demanding collateral or personal guarantees and so on. So if you're a small, if you're a small entrepreneur uh, running an SME, you want to grow, you want to create jobs, it's very difficult. It is very difficult to raise, raise capital. What I think is changing to get to the subject of the panel is that innovation and technology are offering us new routes to intermedia intermediation, yeah. um, both on debt and on equity. And I think E, in his remarks, made a very important point about venture capital. And it's, 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 it's important to recognize that you know, young technology companies actually don't need debt. They need equity. Banks typically anywhere in the world do not provide equity. So we do need that ecosystem of venture capital funds. And it is encouraging to see in Africa and places like 
Lagos and, and Nairobi and Cape Town and even here in, in, in Kigali, that you are beginning to see the, uh, the you're seeing the beginning of a, a venture capital ecosystem. And our job is to support that, so we've invested in, in, in a number, of, di a number of, of different funds. The other key element and the other key uh, thing that uh, potential that technology offers is around this credit model. Because uh, but the availability of much greater amounts of data, the availability of artificial intelligence allows us to use, other than demanding collateral from a borrower, allows us to use other methods to assess the credit worthiness of the, of the borrower that are cheaper uh, and, and allow us to allow uh, um, uh, credit organizations to tailor their loan more effectively. So I think that has here, and in, in indeed in every country, this use of technology to better assess credit, to make loans more cheaply, to monitor those loans more cheaply, and to reach a much broader base of, of smaller companies is really very exciting. Yeah. Do you think we need to rethink the model? Is it broken? Or are we talking here a case of a panel beating a few corners and getting things right again? The banking model. The, bank, the banking model. Look, I, I have to say that in, in my experience, particularly in Africa, um, and I'm, I'm generalizing here, but I think to a large extent, the banking model has failed the real economy. And it has um, swept up deposits. It has used those deposits to fund governments. It's used those deposits to fund large, large uh, principally large companies. I think we as DFIs have almost supported that by providing uh, a capital straight onto the balance sheets of these large banks. So, I don't know that the answer is to, uh, um, for regulators or governments to bring in draconian rules to change the model. Yeah. I think the, the what, what, again, what the techno technology digital revolution of the last 20 or 25 years has allowed us to do is to di disintermediate that model, yeah. to provide solutions yeah. for those pla in those places that aren't being reached. And that's what I think uh, you're including with some of the companies you have on this panel, that's what we're going to see happen. And our job is to provide capital to help support those companies to grow. Yeah, and you're sitting to one of, next to one of them, Chantal. That's where you come in, right? Because you are coming into a sector. Yes, you are providing important communication services, etc. but we also know that you are bringing in another tool. And uh, almost without permission, you are disrupting the model that has failed as you considered. And are adding something. Your opening thoughts about creativity. I know I'm talking to your book. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I'm emphasizing on, on collaboration. Uh, disrupting is not yet 100% done. We're still uh, working with the traditional financing to be able to uh, have some product in the hands of our customers. Uh, but on the other side, uh, what is important for me is uh, having, you know, on our side, we are able to use the big data. Uh, to, we are able to use artificial intelligence, and at the same time, uh, we have reg regulatory, uh, you know, technology, which allow us to create product easily at a cheaper cost. Uh, and those products, you know, we create them using sandboxing. Uh, the distance, the people, the costs uh, become um, affordable for, for, uh, for the company, which is any fintech doing so, um, which also means that uh, the, our customers who are going to use those products are going to enjoy our product at an affordable price. But at the same time, uh, we're not doing it alone. Uh, we have those information. We have uh, at least what we are getting from telco uh, business, because we are coming from tel techno, uh, telco business to finance, to fintech. Uh, but still, we still have the knowledge uh, we've been using to understand uh, what a customer can, uh, you know, the profile of a customer, the consumption he has, and use it to manage to lend them. I, I'm really insisting on the individuals uh, because uh, those are the people who uh, most of the time fail to get attention when it comes to capital. And uh, the com I understand the commercial banks, the traditional uh, financing, uh, f have attention to big projects. Uh, but w when I, yesterday I was thinking about, uh, the, 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 when they spoke about the value of uh, the food in 2030, uh, they said one trillion dollars. Uh, for me, I say we don't know where the business is. This is the right time 
to start focusing on agriculture. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I had a discussion with uh, Diana right before whereby uh, using this uh, new technology, uh, we have can you know support the farmers who does normally who does, don't really have attention uh, fr from from most of the traditional banking, yeah. but they have attention from us. But at the same time, we cannot handle it alone. I believe there is a lot of things which the government can do, uh, looking into having a, a you know a, a fund guarantee which can uh, support the the farmers. At the same time, on our side, we can yeah. accompany them on um, uh, financial, uh, I think, uh, education, making them understand how everything is done and, uh, you know, uh, using, again, uh, what we know how to do, uh, yeah. support them to where they're going. Yeah. You sound to me like uh, the friendly thief. Um, <laughs> you want to work with the existing system, but find ways in which you can save those people that the existing system has not been able to reach. Fantastic. But I wanted to ask you a question, in part uh, that Nick referred to. How have you found the regulators to your presence? Enabling, resisting, or recognizing you because you knocked at the door? I think we have a support from uh, the regulator. Uh, it's known, I think, Rwanda is one of the countries I, I believe understand where uh, this sector is going. We have a support from the ministries and everyone. Uh, we, we, I spoke about a little bit on uh, regulatory technology, whereby we need to uh, use uh, sandboxing to create product or to facilitate the lending using uh, scoring uh, uh, sitting uh, somewhere else, mm -hmm. and uh, the regulator really understand that, and uh, we really we are really supported. Yeah. So there's of course there's a lot of things I believe which can be uh, reviewed uh, and changed yeah. uh, in terms of uh, taxes and other things because whatever we do on uh, the companies it also yeah. affect uh, yeah. the, the the cost. Uh, and the value we, we give to the end user. Sure. Yeah. Let me bring in the old bankers. Um, let me begin with you, Mark. You have listened to uh, the traditional and the new, but you operate in the area where you are trying to help everybody create a new system that is capable and able of enabling us to reach the unbanked and those who are capital hungry. Speak to the topic, please. Well, <clears throat> that's the first time I've been called an old banker, but I, I, I take that as a kind of compliment, but thank you, Godfrey. Um, so, yes, uh, indeed. I mean, FSD Africa really is about um, building an ecosystem that is supportive of, um, of innovation. So I think we all know that you can't create a market by investing in one successful company. You just, that just doesn't happen. So you have to look at the entirety of the market ecosystem from um, the talent, as he was talking about earlier, particularly in the fintech area, um, around the policies and regulations, around access to data, uh, all those sort of things conspire to, to create a market. And, and so, so we exist to help support that. Um, I do think, um, and, and regulation is a massive part of that, and regulation cuts across everything. Um, so from uh, tax and tax incentives, uh, from um, creating the, the kind of uh, regulatory architecture uh, which is really critical, and Chantal will know better than anybody else, the whole mobile money thing, the debate around how to regulate mobile money has been huge. Um, so, so regulation is, is critically important. I do think, I, I think the critical piece here is really to develop a listening stance vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the market that we operate in in, in Africa. So I, I just want to talk about one particular thing, which is the need to back local entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and to work with what there is in the market. And, and just to highlight one particular thing, if we think about crowdfunding, mm. um, crowdfunding hasn't really got going. Uh, we've been looking at developing a crowdfunding market in, in Africa for about seven or eight years, and it hasn't really got going. And you have to ask the question, why is that? And is it because, in fact, there are already different kinds of investment companies, Chalmers in Kenya, the Susus in West Africa, and so on. Yeah. And so we need to find ways to harness those kinds of structures and provide them with the support that we need. And I. Um, just, to, just to say, uh, FSD Africa invested uh, $10 million a couple of uh, weeks ago 
in uh, something called Niala Ventures, which is designed, which is really a network of um, alternative local capital providers who, are all, who have all been relatively successful. Yeah. But they don't really look like traditional funds, sure. but they are close to the SME markets. And yeah. I think we need much more of that kind of venturesome approach to supporting local yeah. SME development. Yeah. I want um, Samuel and Joe to speak to my second question, which I'm going to put to you first, Mark. Uh, and this is to do with how you have seen regulators, I mean, you could extend the conversation to other parts of the world, react to the changing financial systems that are developing in our countries. Have you seen regulators that have actively gone out and say, we want to create an environment that enables entrepreneurship, an environment that enables us to reach the unbanked? I'll start with you, I'll start come to Samuel, and then we do Joe. Uh, well, I, I would say, I mean, our, our purview is Africa, so we, we just work in Africa. But I, I would say the picture is very fragmentary. Um, so you find in some markets, uh, the regulators are very committed to developing the market as well, and, and they understand the need for innovation. Yeah. Um, in other markets, regrettably, I think the regulators are much more interested in preserving the status quo. Yeah. And so you have to think about how do you create the incentives for change. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's a very mixed picture. Yeah, actually, because I was rewording my question in my head as I, was, as I was listening to you and I was thinking we should be asking actually whether regulators are innovators. Samuel? Thank you. Um, I think the Kenyan situation is slightly different in Africa. I think the, the reason mobile money, for instance, grew a bit faster in Kenya over the years was because there was a bit of, the regulator was a bit more supportive, even more than the bankers, the AIC. The bankers were a bit hesitant. They felt maybe somebody else might take away their pie, but the regulator did egg us on towards accepting mobile money and working with. So, that is almost a signal. I mean, it's modern mobile money is not the only innovation, but it is just a signal of in, in the whole space that uh, there was a bit more, a bit more freedom from the regulator with a keen eye to just look at it. However, some of these things, innovations, you cannot know everything about them right at the beginning. You have to keep on observing them. And uh, just talking about even uh, something like mobile money, you, 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 you could get to a point where, for instance, because you're talking about financing, like mobile financing, where people become careless so that you find that somebody is able to cheat the system, gets scored by lender A, and still gets scored by lender B and lender yeah. C. So they create a pyramid. So there are those kind of risks which can emerge and require control and management down there. So even other regulators can learn from those who've gone before. So that you do allow uh, innovation, but at the same time you keenly learn lessons that can help you ensure that the system holds. I need you to speak to the topic as well. Okay, thank you. Just in terms of um, innovation, I think uh, just, okay, sometimes we talk about uh, financing and what's happening. Mm. I think uh, some examples can show that there is change that's been happening. If I speak, for, speak I mean, we are a regional bank now, but uh, as KCB, we've actually seen a lot of change in, 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 in what, what's, how, what's been happening. Mm. Over the last... 10 years, for instance, we've seen just in the area of just transactions, and it speaks ultimately to financing, we've moved over 98%, close to 99% of our transactions to non-branch banking. That means virtually only 1% is happening at a traditional branch 1%. today. 1%. 1%. The rest is happening somewhere else. Wow. Either it's mobile, but anyway, it's not in the branch. <laughs> so that already shows what's happened already, even in what you'd consider, quote, unquote, a traditional bank. We are 126 years old, yet most of it is not happening in the branch, in the 500 branches across, across the region. Then that also takes you to another issue. So what is really happening is that those transactions are a basis for even financing and lending because they give you information, they give you data that previously you did not have if somebody, when, when you were working as a totally traditional bank. Uh, just to give you also another example, when we moved to, we, we introduced mobile lending, uh, we, we saw, our, our, and, and this one we were working with our partner, with our partner Safaricom, we saw our customer base in terms of lending move from 3 million suddenly to 15 million within just 90 days of people who are now able to access, uh, to access finance on the phone. Mm. And that shows you how, sk how scale can be brought around by, uh, by technology. And the lending moved to something like $100 million a month 
just on that, just on these small loans only. You're talking about loans that are a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars happening on a phone. Yeah. This, this is a glimpse of what is possible. But I think more important now, and I talked about the dangers of, of, of mobile lending, is the use of this towards what Diane talked about, the funding gap in SME. What's happening in SME? And for, is, for, us, for us as a bank, we're trying to move, move that power yeah. towards actually SME banking in Kenya. And, we've, and because now you have cash flow data, traditional banking was very much about bringing your piece of land and all sorts of things. Yeah. But now by looking at the kind of data you're able to mine, you do understand the cash flow, you understand the value chain, you understand the ecosystem, and you can lend people, even depending on their cash flow, for a day. Some people actually borrow for a day, amazingly, a day or two. Yeah. or three, seven days all the way to a year with some of the smaller lenders. Yeah. So I think information, data analytics, uh, big data does give us a pot, uh, the possibility to be able to do a lot more financing in an area like, uh, uh, like, like the SME space. Uh, and I think Chantal also mentioned agriculture. That's another area, like a lot of, if you look at Africa, like an example like Kenya, about 80% of, uh, of people are being employed by the SMEs. Yes, that's the place that's underfunded. Agriculture, amazingly, a country like Kenya with the spike in lending is only giving about less than 5% to agriculture. Yet we say that 33% of the GDP is coming from agriculture. Yeah. So how come it is so, so underfunded? Yeah. It's because people haven't understood it, haven't, apart from small indus some industries like the tea industry, most other industries in agriculture are underfunded. Yeah. So those are the innovations that have to trickle to those areas, create the rails, and ultimately use even smart analytics, create the value chains, and, and, and lend to, the, to that yeah. space. But I'll stop there and allow somebody else to answer. All right. Um, Joe, you need to answer the question that I posed to Mark, and then you need to speak to the topic. Okay. Um, I, I'm wearing a couple of hats again today. Um, oh, yeah. I I'm, forgot to actually reintroduce yeah. you. Please okay. do so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my day job is Chief Executive Officer at Jersey Finance, and we're the representative and promotional body for our international finance center. Um, our minister was due to be speaking today, but um, he's quite busy trying to make sure he gets re-elected because we have a general election in Jersey, and he's asked me to step in. So um, I, I'll try not to be political. The, the earlier question about regulator um, and the regulation, uh, we benefited from the fact that we're quite a small jurisdiction in terms of size, and that we have a strong relationship between the government from a policy perspective, the regulator from a regulatory perspective, and the industry. We all have different priorities, we all have different responsibilities, but we can get around the table and try and come to a solution that ultimately works to the benefit of our industry and our customers. The discussion today about getting funds into, into um, the right people we provide a platform to allow international investors to pool funds and invest in different jurisdictions and in different sectors. And I guess to pick up on, on some of the points already made, a lot of our um, fund managers, banks, are quite traditional in terms of their focus. Um, we do have some VC funds, we do have some PE funds, but in a lot of cases the investors are institutional and so they're commercially driven. However, one of the big trends that we are seeing, particularly in the private wealth area, is the requirement for wealth to be used to do good. Um, so the new generation coming through have a different view of the value of their wealth. And their view is that the value of the wealth should really be used to support their own values. And, and a lot of those values are around supporting innovation are around supporting individuals who can't get funding. Yeah. And I think there is an opportunity for us to tap into that a little bit more. So we have um, it probably on a number of levels. We have a number of what we call impact investing funds. And those funds are set up specifically to produce the right impact at the far end. OK, there is a commercial um, priority as well, but actually that's not the top priority. The priority is to invest to help to change people's lives. Yeah. And certainly the performance of some of those funds, in addition to helping benefit people's lives, have also produced 
a decent return to individuals. So I think there's an opportunity to tap into that. And we're also seeing a lot more work in the philanthropic area yeah. with family offices looking to try and deploy family wealth to do good, be that in education, to be that in supporting small business. Uh, and I think there is a big opportunity to do some more work in that area. And it's certainly a growing trend that we're seeing with our in, in, in our industry. Um, and, and also, just as, a, as an aside, Jersey has a government body that gets funded from government that has been investing and helping a lot in Africa over the years. It's the, it's the overseas aid um, organization that we talked about yesterday that has supported the, the Jersey cow and the Rwandan cow story. Um, and they're actively funding uh, microfinance projects aimed at uh, the agricultural sector in specific, in specific regions. You have spoken very well on behalf of the minister. Thank you. I think you shall be very pleased with you. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Shola, I made you listen for a purpose, obviously, because you almost, without the permission of uh, the system as it were, you have thrived. So we run on CNBC Africa uh, polls, and uh, in, in them we always put in a, a third option, which says, I don't care. <laughs> Would you go so far as to say that in terms of how the system has worked with you and the regulation? Yeah, uh, it's something I actually care about. So I really, 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 really care. Um, <laughs> and mostly because I feel like we can't keep things to lock. You know, I suspect that the reason some of us succeeded was just luck. We just met the right person at the right time, in the right place, you know, and that's not how you build the future, you know. So I'll say that it's very important that we get it right. Sure. Um, that's that, um, yeah. And then yeah. I can just jump into my opening thoughts. You can jump into your own thoughts. In terms <laughs> okay, of so, manager. yeah, I, I'm I just tying it to my... for a lot of people here. Yes, yes, but maybe some background. My name is Shola Kennedy, co-founder and CEO at Paystack. Paystack is a payments company. So we help merchants accept payments from their customers. We're live in Nigeria, Ghana, South Africa, Kenya, and hopefully Rwanda very, very soon. Yeah, um, he's listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I think this is something I really care about because Paystack would not have existed if, we, if finance, if the innovative finance didn't work. You know? So I will talk about how we raised money for Paystack, one. And two, talk about why I think we need to, when we talk about finance, maybe we should expand the lens from more than equity and debt. Because I feel like we don't talk a lot more about how to just give people money. I know there's a lot of emphasis on lending people money and all that, but how do we just even help people make more money? Um, if you think about Africa today, Africa has, uh, and Diane talked about the funding gap, but I even think there's a digital gap, you know, digital commerce gap. Africa has 17% of the world's population but just 2% of the people making payments online or digitally, actually. And it's so hard to succeed if you can't take advantage of the population. So why is it so difficult for me to buy something from Lusaka? It's easier for me to buy something from California, 9,000 miles away than Lusaka, or even, like, even in Lagos, if I'm sitting in Lagos. So I think we have to figure out how to help people make money. Um, and it's something I really care about. And I, I'm glad that a lot of banks and a lot of partners are actually looking at how they can support um, just more than lending and um, equity. Um, that said, first part is equity is also very important. So the Paystack story, the Paystack funding story, when I started Paystack, I was just a very young software engineer in Lagos. I felt and I knew that we could build a global payments company, a Pan-African payments company, but the best I could do was just try. You know? And as I was trying to do it, um, thankfully, and I talked about this yesterday, we got invited to Silicon Valley. We got $120,000 um, for 7% of the company. As far as I'm concerned, it was a good deal because there was no company anyway, so I just wanted the money, and, <laughs> and so I just took it. Uh, and it was a very good deal. And it was the foundation, um, because after that, we now had a demo day, something like this. They invited about 700 investors, and you had about two minutes to just talk about your business. And then 
talk about. So you spend three months just, just fleshing out the business, um, and then you talk about your business, yeah. and then I think there's the investors will pick if they like you. You know, it's like seeing that some of you might know it. Um, if you like the person, you say yes. If you don't like them, you say no. Um, about 44 people said they liked, they wanted to hear from me. You know, so I was about 44, I had to talk to 44 people. Um, eventually, I spoke to probably over 150 people uh, because each person you speak to will also just tell you. A lot of people said no, but a lot of people said yes too. Uh, we probably had about 46 investors um, in that round, and we're able to raise about $1.3 million. Sure. And the reason is important because there's, how would I have raised $1.3 million without collateral, without a 20-page <laughs> business plan? I, if you expected me to do that, yeah. I, I just could not have been able to do that. You know? So the model had to change. You had to get to a point where people can prove themselves. They can talk about what they can do, and they can show it. You know? I can make progress with five people. If it works for five people, let yeah. it work for 500. If it works yeah. for 500, yeah. let it work for yeah. 500,000. So yeah. I think that was very important. And, the biggest obstacle we also got, and I'm going to close now, was yeah. that people just could not see the future. And I think that's something we should realize. Like, as we're funding the future, it yeah. is important to see the future. And so the biggest pushback for the people that said no was, oh, what is the size of the payments market in Africa? It must be small, you know, in Nigeria. <laughs> how many people have cards? It's so small. Yeah. But my favorite stat is that last year, Paystack, the company we created, did more than 30 times what Nigeria did that the month I was talking about them. <laughs> so the market, if you're building the future, it will grow, yeah. you yeah. know, and you need to yeah. see yeah. the growth, not yeah. where yeah. they are now. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting, yeah. very interesting. I've got one more follow-up question for you. Thank you. The platforms that we need to reach the people that we need uh, to reach. And then after that question, I want us to talk about the role of government whether we restrict government to uh, just the regulators or we should be looking at governments as potential funders in uh, trying to make sure that the people get the money. Diane, I'm going to start with you. The first two questions that I've wrapped together, the use of technology, uh, the use of uh, 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 new uh, platforms that we can use to try to make sure that we reach the SMMEs that you have said you are still to reach in the numbers that you want. Uh, thank you. I think it's, it's very uh, simple. Today, the phone is no longer uh, you know, a device to call or to send messages. You get uh, financial services, you get healthcare, you get everything on your phone. So, so we believe going forward, the phone will be used for anyone to access uh, funding, to access advice, to access you know, anything. So, so the phone is going to be critical uh, in the future, and, and that's why I think everyone is focusing uh, efforts in uh, getting and in making sure people can use their phones to do very many things. We've also moved away from, you know, plastic, the card. We believe payments are going to go more and more to, to mobile. So it's, <laughs> so it, it's, it, so, so it's important. I think it, it's important that we all use that connectivity that, you know, a handset that the people have in their hands to provide all the services. Now, the role of government, uh, it's, it's, it's critical. Of course, there's the enabling environment, facilitation, etc., regulation. But beyond that, when it comes to serving, um, uh, you know, maybe more risky segments, we talked about agriculture, MSMEs, I think we, we need to have some risk mitigants in the form of, of guarantees because I don't think a government can, can, can uh, de-risk a project for an, an SME. It's too small for them, you know. But I think if they provide things like portfolio guarantees for particular sectors where we believe there's a lot of impact uh, in terms of growth, transformation, uh, poverty reduction, et cetera, I think that would help. Yeah. And it would sort of de-risk the business for us yeah. and make sure you know, people have more access to yeah. credit, but also insurance and other products. Yeah, I see you have answered the next part, the third part of my questions, which is great, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, you can tie them to. Can I, can I group the bankers to respond to this as a, a group? But first, I want the entrepreneurs, first of all, to uh, talk to uh, the issues around which they are now using technology and how it's playing a greater role in making sure that we're able to reach capital. Chantal, I'll start with you. 
Uh, I think I spoke about it at the beginning when I was dreaming about the one uh, trillion dollar value of food in 2030. It doesn't uh, leave my mind. Uh, first of all, I think talking about innovation, talking about uh, new solution, application, others, we need also to think about smartphone penetration. We still have a very big issue on smartphone penetration. Uh, starting from here, I think we are below 30%. And uh, I really believe the government, uh, all the institutions, I uh, think banks, we need to work together too at that because if you don't manage to push that uh, smartphone penetration to the next level, it will be really hard for uh, those people who want to reach at least to access the fund we are talking about. And at the same time, we really need to uh, take serious re um, uh, financial literacy yeah. Uh, from the beginning, because uh, uh, whatever we put there, if they don't understand how they access uh, the fund or how uh, they can contribute to the growth of their, in let's say, their industry being the agriculture, yeah. then it will be very hard. So um, our role as uh, fintech is really because we reach those people. We work with uh, uh, farmers in many places. We work with individuals. Uh, we started already did that step of really uh, making sure that we uh, avail the affordable smartphone. Uh, this is the phase one we, we worked on. We are not yet there. It is uh, uh, something we are continuing to work on uh, with partnership with the banks and others and the government really supporting on that. Yeah. Um, after that, I think the government may come in to avail some fund uh, for the fund guarantee for uh, those farmers uh, because I think banks support the associations. But we have individuals, someone with the, a chili farm somewhere, but he needs some, um, not a lot of money just for the next mile of uh, his, uh, uh, his, his farm yeah. and needs to pay people or something like that, but he cannot yeah. access the fund. Yeah. So this is the, the, the particular area I believe we, uh, uh, FinTech yeah. will come in uh, to support them and at the same time uh, avail uh, the education, uh, the other, because it's not only the fund they need, yeah. we also can support them with uh, other things, education to their, their family, their, ki their kids, uh, you know, sponsoring their businesses, using our product at an affordable price. Yeah. So we, we're really uh, looking into um, supporting this journey, uh, yeah. one with smartphone penetration, and yeah. second, uh, using our, our artificial intelligence, our big data we have in place, our experience in technology yeah. to avail product at an affordable price. How do you propose government help with uh, smart, uh, smartphone penetration? I'll give you an interesting example from South Africa. Uh, because of COVID-19, the government said it was going to provide, I think it was airtime or data, I think it's data. The government said it was going to try to provide data to the people. It was controversial. Uh, they I say it from companies including MTN, because now the question is how do you get that data to the people? Simple question. How do we get government to help? So uh, let me at least touch a little bit on the initiative we had, I think, two years ago, uh, where MTN with government, with other institutions, we had uh, um, an initiative where uh, we, we were availing uh, smartphone to uh, the people who cannot have it, the most vulnerable. Of you give them for free? Yes, yes. And um, the, the initiative was called Connect Rwanda. Uh, we were really connecting the people who were not connected. Uh, but in mind of uh, telco or in mind of fintech, we really wanted them not only to access the smartphone, but access all the finance, all the education part of uh, the business, and you know at least contribute to the growth of the economy we are looking for. Yeah. And we all know that those untapped areas are yeah. where the money is. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. I've got 20 minutes to go. So we need to get cracking quickly. Shola, you come in, and then I'll ask my bankers, as I said, to speak uh, on, it, on the same topic. Okay, yeah, no, I, I, I think personally that um, there's a generation of people building for Africa, and technology is something that we have to build for ourselves. Like, we can't just expect foreign technology to work here. And so I'm thinking about local applications, and, and I think more and more of that is happening, and yeah. we should continue to support it. Did uh, you say that, do you know the case of Mara in South Africa? The what? 
Do you know the case of Mara in South Africa? Oh, yeah, so it's a story over coffee. There's a lot of coffee oh, around I here in, exactly, uh, in Rwanda. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, no, exactly. So, <laughs> so I, I, I think that. And then the second part that really, really frustrates me and annoys me and makes me cry yeah. is that African businesses are underserved and undertooled. Exactly. Like, if you start a business in Lagos and somebody else starts in London, you can already tell who has a competitive advantage. You know, um, final story, one minute before I go. During COVID, I, I felt so bad because everybody shut down. And I know my hair is scattered, but I have barbers. And so my barbers in San Francisco, I had cut my hair in like three different cities. I got a, an email from the barber in San Francisco that, oh, we're shutting down. Please support us. Buy a gift card. Done. I got an email from a barber in New York. Oh, we noticed you've, you've shopped, with, you've cut your hair out of place, you can buy our shirts, support us. Yeah. And there was a Baba five, I was in Lagos, yeah. literally five blocks from me. I yeah. didn't hear from him yeah. for six months, <laughs> and I was so sad. He didn't have access to the tools yeah. to help him yeah. do that. So yeah. I think we should do more, and we should build for businesses. Do you want any help from the government? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think government Quickly. should support the builders. I think... There's a lot of things government can do for us, you know, yeah. just keeping things easy, giving us guidelines, you know, providing places where we can work and all that. And I think it's happening, to be honest. Um, so I'm excited. Yeah. Samuel, Nick? Yeah, thank you. We'll come to Mark after you guys. Okay, thank you. I think uh, there is no doubt that technology is inevitable if we have to scale. I think if, if you're going to reach a market like the whole East African community, 300 so odd, you can't use the traditional way to be able to scale and reach the needs that are here. So it's absolutely inevitable. Uh, one of the ways we are, we've approached it, and I think people like traditional bankers may approach it, is in reality we actually have like almost two systems in one today as an organization. We have actually two operating systems. One which is running the old big loans, single person who's borrowed your $150 million, and one that is only for quick payments, quick loans, and stuff like that. So we've, we've literally split into two to create an ability to scale rapidly at the level where we may want to reach the SMEs, reach somebody in Kinshasa. <coughs> so I think that there's a need for people to realize that there's... We, we don't have the luxury of time. The time is now for us to move very rapidly, reach the rural areas in Africa, and we can only do that with a lot of skill. Yeah. And uh, the other thing about what even the, in the traditional bank, there is a need to digitize virtually everything you're doing. It's not just a, even if you even if you can fill a form, can you be able to digitize? So every single process that exists today in the bank, you should be able to digitize it, even if it's a trade transaction. So we are moving away even where you're filling forms to digitizing absolutely every single customer journey. And the next thing is ultimately to transform the bank digitally. This is inevitable. So, so technology transformation is actually a journey. The one thing about uh, the support that you require is that one of the things about regulation and, and things like banking is a highly regulated industry. And the only way to sometimes permit or to allow things to happen is to create a bit of a sandbox idea even within the regulators where you say allow experimentation. Unfortunately, in traditional banking, errors are severely punished. <laughs> but in reality, no mistakes. You can't learn without making a few mistakes. You've got to walk, even your toddler has to walk fall a few times. Yeah. So we punish severely any error. Whereas we should agree that the only way we will as, as Africa grow rapidly, is create yeah. some room where a few yeah. errors are, are, are allowed. So I think that's what I would ask from regulators. Allow us to make a few mistakes, yeah. but put the mistakes in a specific sandbox room, yeah. and we will be able to learn and show us dream about a digitized yeah. Africa yeah. will happen. Yeah, yeah. Nick? Um, yeah, so look, a lot of the points around innovation have been made. I mean, I, I, I completely support actually Chantal's point about infrastructure, particularly in Africa. We need high-speed internet access. We need better mobile access. And that's a real role, I think, for development finance institutions. That's why we've been investing a lot of money in Kenya and Ethiopia in, in supporting that infrastructure build-out. 
And then I think Joe's made the point about credit models, that there is a, uh, a new way of thinking about credit, whereas before, as bankers, we would step back and say, well, can you pledge your house? Can you give me a personal guarantee? Because if you can't do that, then my loan is not safe and I won't extend the loan. I think that has um, <clears throat> technology and big data is really changing that because we have ways of looking and assessing, as I said earlier, credit worthiness based on, 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 on data rather than uh, assets. Um, just a word on government. I want, to, um, I want to be very boring and traditional here and just put in a word for the regulator. I mean, Joe said uh, banking and finance is a highly regulated industry. It needs to be a highly regulated industry. Investor protection is important. Having appropriate lending standards is appropriate. And we've seen in lots of countries in the world where this has been an issue. So I think we need to, I don't know if there's any regulators in the room, but I think we need to say that yeah. this, this we, the, the, yeah. we, it's important. I think the question is, as you raised right at the beginning, is are they sufficiently innovative? If I was a regulator, I, w I would not feel incentivized to innovate. To so I think like the sandbox idea is a very yeah. interesting. Yeah. How can we push them? Yeah. It, can you, the point you made about uh, M-Pesa, why did M-Pesa start? It started start, sort of because the regulators took their eye off the ball a little bit. And then, um, and then in other countries, it has moved much more slowly. Yeah. That's, not a good, that's probably not a good thing. So I think it's how do we find, strike the right balance between having strong regulation that protects investors and individuals yeah. uh, and people who borrow money versus, on the other hand, how can we pro pro poke them to yeah. be a little bit more yeah. uh, flexible and innovative. Yeah, and I think sometimes it might actually be a lack of regulation that enables the innovation to take seed and root and run. Mark? <laughs> yeah, thank you. Very gracious of you to give space for the, uh, to the old bankers. And, and I, to say again, I never actually worked for, an old, for a bank. But anyway, okay. um, Godfrey, I, I, you, in your opening remarks, you made the point about um, the market, the, the, the context that we're operating in at the moment and how difficult it is. And, and I guess when we're talking about the role of governments, um, that's, that's one thing I, uh, and, and by government I include uh, development finance institutions as well, like, like uh, mine and, and, and Nick's. I just feel, um, you know, we are. Th this is the moment where government does need to s step in and be aggressively counter-cyclical. I think. Mm. I mean, I, I really feel that we're in a. I mean, I, I feel we are in a, in an, an incredibly difficult environment in which, um, <clears throat> in which, um, you know, seriously good businesses and funds yeah. are not getting capital because of what we're going through at the moment. Yeah. And How that is, Sorry. How. How well, the they, well, no, these, are, these are businesses that are, are, are looking for capital to continue their growth because they've got great plans, but they're not, they're not getting the capital because of the market that we're, in, we're yeah. in. People are concerned about exchange rates, rightly. They're concerned about inflation and so on and so forth. So this is, but this is the moment, I think, where governments and um, development finance needs to step in and be counter-cyclical and take some of that risk. And I think it was really good, the, the point that both Shola and Nick were making about um, it's, it's actually equity that's, the, that's at the core of this for, for small businesses. You know, we can do the debt piece in any which way, but you can't do debt unless there is equity in the first place. Yeah. And so that's the whole point, really, is how do we get that risk taking to happen in the yeah. first place? And that is where governments can come in. And just to slightly sort of nudge the, the discussion also in, in one way, which is that the other role of government is to open up new sectors for, entirely for for entrepreneurship. Um, and I do think when you look at um, the green sectors that we uh, are, have all been talking about quite significantly for the last two or three um, years, you know, I think there is a great deal of opportunity there. But it, it's only going to, so for example, around um, adaptation, for ar around um, the privately delivered public goods in the circular economy, for example. <clears throat> That's where government, I think, can help to create whole new markets, yeah. carbon markets, yeah. in an entire asset class, or in, indeed a family of asset class, classes yeah. that I think Africa could really benefit from. Yeah. Um, and that requires regulation and support and risk-taking by government. So I do think, um, I mean, no innovative environment ever got started without an active role played by government. Yeah. It never did. That's true. Um, if you think about the internet, if you think about... Um, you know, Mariana, Matsu Carter, all those sort of people, yeah. you need government to play its full yeah. role. Activist governments. Yeah. I think it will be music to many people. Joy, is it music to your ears? <laughs> you are wearing your ministerial head, by the way. Thank you very much. Um, actually, some of the points I was going to make about the regulator, 
um, have already been made, but I think it's also important for government to set the policy around regulation. So the regulator has to operate within an international environment, correct, but also the, the uh, government needs to set the risk policy for the jurisdiction, and um, the regulator should also be aware of the government's policy on innovation and economic growth, because the regulator can't operate in isolation. So one of the things that we have done is try to ensure that regulatory, regulatory decisions are based on international standards, but also the government's view on um, economic growth. And innovation, we've encouraged the sandbox opportunity with the regulator, which has run quite well. I think, and just to pick up the, the previous point, governments need to pull whatever levers they can to deliver on their policy, be that innovation or um, economic growth. And, and if you take the comments earlier on about the lack of um, internet capacity, we're a small jurisdiction and our telecoms, main telecoms provider, is 100% owned by the government. The government has been under a lot of pressure in, over the years to sell the asset. But the, the clever people, thankfully, took the view that this was a strategically important asset and as a consequence could not be profit and loss driven. It's about delivering good for the island. And as a consequence, we invested a significant amount of money in um, fiber optic connectivity, one gigabit, to every home and business on the island. That would never have happened in a commercial operation simply because it wouldn't have returned a profit yeah. quickly enough. Yeah. That has stood us in great stead in terms of, of, of COVID, in great stead in terms of a global business and accessibility to us, and it stood us in good stead in our growth in our digital economy. So I guess my point is that government needs to be aware of the levers that they can pull mm -hmm. and not be afraid to pull them and, and provide consistency in yeah. terms of those messaging. Yeah, I'm going to take everything that you have said here, guys and ladies, um, I'm gender neutral, um, and say we are looking for activists, governments in this environment because we need leadership from those governments. But not only, not only that, we need those people in government, you and I, and all the voters who are at home, to be innovative. So key that we follow that path in order to be able to find the, 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 the answers that we require in this environment. Our official time is run out. I am looking to my timer to see if I can take a few questions. But uh, since he is silent, I am going to take the liberty. He has just said okay. I'm going to take the liberty of uh, asking, uh, do we have a roving microphone? We do, yes. So come through, sir. There's a hand there, and then we can take one here and then balance it with one over there. Very quickly if you can. Otherwise, I won't be paid for my lunch. Thank you very much. Um, May I also I appeal to you to be quick? To yes, the I will do. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jabo Butera, and uh, just two quick questions. Um, I hear everyone talking about how to borrow money, how to um, access money, but no one is talking about saving. Even when you're talking about total savings, where you get the money from, those people have been saving that money, that's where we're going to borrow from them. But we're not teaching our children how to save money. I think that's the big problem we're having in the economy. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Let's take, uh, there was a hand here. Oh, they did. Oh, you, you came late, sir. Good morning, everyone. My name is Raul Fassi, and I'm the founder of a young company in Cameroon called Skyview Solutions. We develop an application for monitoring construction projects through your phone, um, which is simple and reliable. Now, the question I have is, as all young companies, young entrepreneurs, we struggle with financing. And I moved back to Cameroon to start this company and ran out of money a year and a half after that and had to go back to the U.S., to work some more and finance the project. And we just finished developing it. And I was wondering, what would you say is the most direct way, so if you feel like you've built something that is worth it, that is interesting, and you've gotten feedback from your surrounding, and everyone has validated the value of it, what would you say is the most direct way of accessing um, funding, or at least interacting with people that can provide funding? Thank you. Okay, final question. There's a hand right, right there. Uh, I'm trying to make sure we're gender neutral. Hi, um, good morning. My name is Tanya Mulamula. I'm from Tanzania. 
I run a regional communications and conference management agency. Uh, my partner who runs our office here is attending another session. But um, access to finance and SME financing is a very big topic and close to my heart. As we're growing regionally and we're scaling up, we have no debt. I don't think that's a good thing because I'm using my own money, friends, fools, family to finance us to grow. But when we're in these panels, we've been in many with AFDB and um, female-owned, female-run companies, we don't get down to the technicalities. So I'll just put, raise one question to the banks and maybe the MNOs in terms of we don't want um, loans per se right now. We want to scale, but when I go to the bank, I would like invoice financing or LPO discounting. I want a credit line, yeah. but I have to give my unborn child my <laughs> has coll you know has collateral. I would, you know, how do we you know we need money to scale so we can become bigger taxpayers and contribute to the economy positively? We're not looking for grant money. We're not social impact. We're purely privately funded. But we are the ones that if we get more funding and scaling, we employ more people, we pay more taxes, etc. But when we go down to the banks, invoice just I have a contract for one year, or I'm organizing Shogam, but I will need to finance this for maybe a quarter of a million dollars, but I don't have a quarter of a million dollars, but Shogam will pay me. So I have an LPO, I have a contract, but the bank will not finance me in order to finance my company to pitch for this type of um, conference. Yeah. Yeah. Same thing. So how do banks go down for um, credit, non, uh, credit um, options without financing for short-term or yeah. mid-term growth? Thank you very much. I'm so sorry. We can't take any more questions. Yeah, he's ready to take me out. Um, can we answer the questions? Uh, I didn't hear some of the names very clearly. Diane, you're ready to answer the lady or whichever part you want to answer. And guys, feel free to then volunteer to answer uh, the question that you think was specific to you. Diane? Thank you. I think that <clears throat> there was a question on, on savings, that we don't teach our children to save more, and, mm. and I agree with that. And I, I think that that's precisely why uh, cost of money is, is high here, because you look at the pool of saving is, is very small compared to the investments that, you know, and, and as banks, what we do is to deploy savings to investment. So I agree, and, and, and I think the government has done some great things here, introducing Ejo Heza and, and, you know, sort of pension schemes for people in the informal sector, and this is giving us access to long-term uh, uh, saving. But I agree we need to do more. When you, we look at countries that have, you know, uh, traveled this journey of transformation, uh, the savings rate per, per GDP was uh, very high, and we need, really need to move to 30, 40 percent uh, savings to GDP. So the question about bank loans uh, for uh, young uh, uh, companies that have uh, large contracts, etc. So the bank, we are not able to take execution risks without being, you know, uh, covered. It, it's as simple as that. But if you have executed on a contract and you're just waiting for payment, we are ve it's very easy. We actually buy the invoice, and this is called, called factoring, and we're able to give you funding immediately. Uh, but again, if you are executing a contract, it can be a very good contract outside the country, or you know, uh, we just are not able to take that execution risk if we are not covered. And I agree it's difficult, uh, but I think that that's you know, the way it is. I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave uh, the question from the young entrepreneur fr from Cameroon to Shola. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Uh, Nick, you want to come in? Yeah, so d let me just come in on that third, uh, on the lady with the third question, because I thought that really was illustrating the whole challenge that we're trying to get to. Running a... Here now? Yeah, so I was just saying that... Uh, I'll just talk, talk quickly to the, to the third question, because I think the lady... Uh, illustrates exactly the problem that we're trying to get to. Uh, she's working extraordinarily hard to, win, to, build a, to try to build a, a successful business and can't get the financing to do that. And actually, we weren't really talking as, about equity. We were talking about much more plain vanilla sources of, of, of finance, uh, invoice financing and trade financing, factoring, whatever. I think the answer to that question, I don't think, lies in the banks in the long term. And if you look at countries like the UK or the US or, in Indi or countries like India, what you find is, sorry. I don't know what's going on with this microphone. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, we can clear this yeah. microphone. Try again. Try again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
So I think when you go to those other countries, what you find is it's not banks that are providing the answers. It's non-bank financial companies. Technology makes those companies easier to start, easier to run, and easier to be more profitable. So I think that's the direction that we will be going in here as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Shola, I think there was a question that was uh, coming your way. Uh, by the way, I yeah. wanted to say, I'm not, uh, I don't work for Africa Export Import Bank, but I do know that uh, they run a factoring course. And uh, perhaps that's one place you could start it. Yeah. Um, this is the question of how to get financing. Um, yeah. yeah. I think it always starts with family and friends. Um, I think if you're if you lucky, <laughs> like me, <laughs> and your family and friends don't have money for you, then the scope now keeps getting bigger. I think, thankfully, the angel investors, as Future Africa, the, the few more structured entities that can give quick decisions. And what I ask founders for is quick decision. And I tell people, anybody that will waste my, anybody that can't give you a decision quickly, don't talk to them. If they're gonna spend one year trying to give you a decision, then it's too late, you'll, have, you'll be dead. So I would say, look out for quick decision. And a no is good. If, you, if I ask you for money now and you tell me no, I prefer it than for you to tell me, oh, let me talk to my boss, let me, you know, it's good. So I'd say, just keep increasing the scope. Um, and the final point is that one of the best qualities of a good founder is resourcefulness. So the difference between a good founder and a bad founder is resourcefulness. So as a founder, it is your work, unfortunately, I know the world is unfair, but it is your work to be as resourceful as possible to find to look around and find that person that will take a chance on you. And as long as you keep pushing, you will find that person. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, help me to thank our panelists for some very innovative, creative ideas. And I'm certainly hoping that you take the message around Innovation Home. And when you vote next, don't just vote for that person. Please vote for an innovative person. Thank you very much for listening to us.